In this video, I'm going to teach you how to properly plan and set up an Airbnb property, how to furnish your Airbnb apartment or your home. And we're specifically gonna cover the topics of choosing pieces based on like aesthetic, durability, cleanability, replaceability, functionality, like all this good stuff. These are important topics because if you set up an Airbnb apartment in, in a hurry and don't really plan ahead and plan for the future, things are gonna break, um, they're gonna wear out, uh, they're gonna be unsightly, you're gonna end up having to give guest refunds and then replace stuff that costs you money down the road. And this can be prevented on the front end. So um, I'm setting up 13 apartments as we speak here in Philadelphia in the same building. Uh, and um, there's a lot of boxes, as you can see, but this is obviously fresh in my mind. So I think I'm well qualified to talk to you about furnishing Airbnb properties. My name's Sean Rocky Geach. I actually have over 100 properties on Airbnb. Been doing this for six years. And let's jump into furnishing your first or next Airbnb. <laughs> Welcome back, Airbnb family. Thank you so much for tuning in on this video. Uh, this is a fun one because it's so fresh in my mind as you see all these boxes. I'm setting up 13 apartments at the same time right now here in Philadelphia um, and more to come in this building. It's a, a pretty big negotiation that I did. Uh, they actually gave me $500,000 in rent concessions to pick up this deal and I've got a video on that um, a few videos back. So I wanna talk to you about the six main like key metrics, the factors that we use when choosing stuff that we buy, whether it's furniture, decor, stuff for the kitchen, new stuff like that, um, and their relationship with each other, and how some things need to have certain characteristics and some things don't. Uh, the implications matter. So when you do Airbnb, uh, the most time and cost effective part of this business is staging, taking photos, setting the thing up, and then getting it listed, right? You spend the most money and you spend the most time on it. From there, it should be easily maintained where guests are just checking in and out. Um, you're dealing with them through the phone and you're doing light maintenance. But if you don't do this appropriately, you don't plan ahead for things to break or things to wear down, you know, like you don't pick your pieces because of that inevitable future, um, things will go wrong eventually where things will start to look like grody and dirty even though it's technically in the best condition it can be in at the time and guests will want refunds because things don't look like they were in the photos or they don't look good and then you're gonna have to you're gonna have to replace stuff or things are just gonna break and then you have to spend people time and resources to go replace things that break um, and this stuff costs you money down the road so when you set up an airbnb right from the beginning you should be looking at the next two years at least of the future of your property because we budget for about two years of use at minimum for the stuff that we buy so before we get into the details, please like this video. Um, I really do appreciate it. It helps the video perform. It really does. The algorithm's fun like that. And subscribe if you're new. Welcome to the channel. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about the functionality of running the Airbnb business. And of course, I welcome you to watch like playlists. I've got ones on topics. So the six things that we look for when setting up an Airbnb property, first off, is price, right? Everything's driven by price because we have a budget. If you blow your budget and spend like $20,000 more in your home than you should, it's gonna take you so much more money, time to get your money back, right? So there is always a ceiling on budget. You've gotta be thrifty within that number. But then there's things like aesthetic. Things have to look good in the photos. They also have to look good when the guest shows up. Uh, there's durability. Like I said, things can't be breaking randomly and you're constantly sending people to replace or fix stuff. That's tough. Things have to be cleanable, right? They have to be serviceable. So um, like, for example, like fabric can stain where leather does not. And so like things like that, where you might be keeping it in the best condition you can put it in, but a year from now, it's gonna look diminished a year from now. And that means you're probably gonna have to replace it when a guest gets upset about it. Like, so that's the kind of whole, the cleanable aspect. And then there's the replaceability, um, where you need to find things that are either common enough that you can always buy them, or they are neutral enough that you can replace them with a like product, something similar where you won't have to go shoot new photos again, right? So replaceability matters there. And then functionality. Um, there's things that you buy because they look good, they're a good value, but um, they just suck, right? And we're gonna talk about a few things that you shouldn't really buy for your space because they, they actually harm your guest experience, you know, for example, as opposed to actually you know, giving them a better one. So functionality matters too. Um, so yeah, let's jump right in. Let's talk about budget. So we spent about $5,000 on uh, an apartment, like all, out the door, one bedroom or smaller apartment complex like this. And that covers all of your basics like furniture. Um, it covers the decor to make your place look competitive, like an accent wall that you paint um, to make it pop. Um, all the amenities that make you more competitive, like a coffee station with the decaf and the tea, full length mirror, um, you know, TV with the Disney Plus on it, all that good stuff. And then of course, um, getting in rent and security deposit and stuff like that. But I negotiate a lot of like rents and security deposit discounts and that's why I can get in for less than $5,000. I'm getting a lot of free rents on the front end typically and that's how that number comes. Now we add $2,000 per bedroom in budget for staging. 
Uh, but if it's a house, um, add a thousand dollars to the base, so six thousand instead of five, and then add twenty five hundred instead of two thousand per bedroom. So you're looking at about eleven thousand for a three bedroom house as opposed to nine thousand for a three bedroom apartment. And that's based on square footage, and usually homes have a little bit more needs uh, because. Apartments tend to like have more amenities, better fixtures, and all that good stuff right out the door. Where if you sell a landlord on letting you Airbnb their property, um, there's more that you have to put in there, more love to make the thing competitive. And that's why there's a little bit more money there. Now let's first talk about aesthetic. See, the aesthetic of the home isn't about the individual quality of the piece, but how it all comes together. So if you've ever walked through an Ikea and saw all the little rooms that they make, that stuff isn't expensive stuff, but they find a way to make these rooms look really cool. And so you can increase the overall aesthetic of your space by using common themes that tie together well, and like painting an accent wall can give you a pop of color. And you know, using just like a few main colors where you might have a couple more cool colors and then one pop of warm, right? So you like, you do like blue, um, like maybe two shades of blue and then like just canary yellow, for example, right? It'd be a way to like use like, use like, a, like an electric blue a royal blue or something and then a midnight blue and then a pop of canary yellow and that's a way to use three colors in a space and it's gonna make it look really clean. You can always cut your colors with neutrals. You can always use anything white, black or on the grayscale um, because they don't really make more chaos. I wouldn't recommend doing more than three colors and you want to make sure that those colors have a relationship with each other and then have fun with the accent wall and all the good stuff, right? Textures um, matter too. So if everything's like farmhouse style, like wood, metal, leather, that's really cool. Um, if you do something modern, um, you could do things that are more like glass, acrylic, like plastic, but like like more quality plastic, um, like that white porcelain style plastic and stuff like that, and go for this more modern contemporary, maybe some like stone, like um, some really smooth concrete stuff, uh, custom poured. I mean, that starts to get expensive, but you get my point. Now, this leads to what's, what's gonna be the next one, which is like, like serviceability. But what I do wanna hammer home here is aesthetic is about designing a room as a composition and making sure you pay attention to like the, the little details and give the place personality. And you're doing it for the photos. More so than for the space, you're doing it for the photos. So as long as your home looks good at a couple key angles and you can get some good shots out of it, that's good enough. So you don't have to like adorn the place and overload it so that way it looks good at every single angle. If you are on a budget and you want a good aesthetic and you kind of end up having to cut corners anywhere, skip one wall, right? Just skip one wall and just kind of basic out that wall, but make sure that your photos don't include that one wall, right? And that's just coming in on a budget. You can always upgrade that later as you make some more money if you want to. But serviceability is next. See, the reason why the examples I gave you were like wood, metal, leather, plastic, acrylic, glass, concrete, is because they can be cleaned, right? Um, and this is super important. What I've noticed with a lot of stuff that we've bought, even high quality items, if they've got that fabric top to it, um, like couches that are fabric or bar stools that are fabric, those stain. Um, and if you've got like certain types of certain types of wood too, certain types of wood tops where like a uh, cup sweats on the wood and then it gets a ring on it, that's no fun. And then there are like 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 lacquer um, nightstands that if like somebody spills something on the nightstand, then it creates this like really weird off color white translucent thing. So there's some stuff that you just shouldn't buy because even though they're cheap and they look nice. Um, the stuff just goes bad, and even though you try to clean them and it says it's sterile, it's not going to look clean. Um, a few examples of other stuff that you may not even be in control of. One of the older properties I picked up in Fort Worth years ago, um, the apartment was so old that the tubs needed to be acid washed. So as clean as we could get them, they still had like this like kind of blackish color, and they kind of had this off texture from excessive cleaning, the outside of the tub was rough looking. And we had to give refunds for a completely clean, pristine, sterile tub because they looked old. And in the photos, that meant that they looked dirty. So um, you should be careful with properties that you pick up where there are things that, that if it looks dirty, but it's clean, that means that that's the best condition you can get it in. And if it's gonna give you problems with guests, you should skip that apartment. And so we be care we're like be careful with tubs. You can get them resurfaced. And so if you're negotiating with an apartment, you should negotiate to resurface those tubs, for an example. But try to stay away from fabrics. Uh, try to stay away from things with cheap coatings. Um, and you know try to make sure you move into a place that has new stuff. Um, and that'll avoid that lack of serviceability. Uh, another example of something that 
uh, is like durable enough to continue to be used, but just starts looking bad. We love the Home Hero knife sets for the most part. They're the ones with the acrylic stands and the, the knives all fan out. They look really pretty. But we've bought a lot of ones that are black and black, black blade, black handle. Problem with that is the blades, as you resharpen them and you use them, uh, the uh, the silver underneath starts to show, and the outside layer starts to like kind of, in a way like chip away as like you know like a ceramic pan would, uh, not a ceramic pan but like one of the like a Teflon pan would, and they just start to look really junky and old. So um, we're now moving to using knives that just have a stainless steel outside because we don't have to worry about the coating going away, um, and that way they last longer. That's one example. Now the acrylic thing, it's actually hard to clean. So that's the only drawback to the Home Hero knife sets is people will stick dirty knives in there for some stupid reason and cleaning the inside part can be really tough. So you really have to stay diligent with your housekeepers to have those cleaned. Um, another example is like um, what coffee stations you use. Keurig machines, they, they go dirty and people don't know how to properly clean Keurig machines. Um, and it's, it's nasty, mold grows inside of them. So I always recommend get a regular coffee station. If you wanna have a perfectly manageable, perfectly clean and pretty coffee situation, you should do a kettle and you should do a pour over like a Chemex with the tin on the top. This means that a, a housekeeper will never forget to open the coffee machine to check for a filter and coffee because they'll forget that sometimes, which sucks. So this coffee station, if it's used, it's obvious and it has to get cleaned every time. So I would recommend those. Now they're not as durable. Somebody could drop the glass or chip the glass and you'll need to replace it. But that's the kind of trade-off that we're looking for here or we're considering is um, for the proper maintenance of the property and proper cleaning, a regular coffee machine doesn't get cleaned properly typically. And I used to work as a barista in a coffee shop and I kind of know how grody that stuff gets. And so I'm leaning towards pour overs and the Chemex style thing just because I think they look cool. It's more of an, like, a, like a do-it-yourself coffee thing, which is kind of a fun activity. Some people hate it, um, but it just saves us from ever disappointing a guest with a, with a subpar quality of clean. So those are some stuff in the kitchen that matters just the same. Now, uh, durability is next. So these things are all still usable, but um, they just become unsightly or problematic. And that's kind of like the point there. But with durable, um, there are things that just like break. Good. They look good and they're cheap and stuff, but like Ikea furniture, that's like the $8 nightstands. They just break and they're hard to repair. And so this is the other part of the durability. Airbnb has got a policy where you have to try to repair something before you build the guest to replace it in its entirety. So we're looking at this a lot at scale as how to manage our property based on durability and how to fix stuff. So we've got this beautiful 10 foot long blue couch that we bought um, off of Sofa Mania because we had a really unique floor plan. And somebody put a cigarette burn mark in it. Well, it's a blue uh, like velvety felt kind of fake fabric. And so it is really tough because, um, I had to throw my phone, it keeps ringing. Um, it's really tough to replace because that fabric's so unique. So we have to pull fabric, like a, like a little patch of fabric from the back of the couch and then patch the cushion and like restuff the couch and then cover the back of the couch with like a black patch or something like that. The part that's not aesthetic can have that off color patch. So that's what we have to do to replace like the fabric of the couch. Now the cool thing with this couch is this fabric doesn't stain like other fabrics, right? Like if you have like the cross stitch like linen or cotton, like, you know, like the weaving, that stuff stains and has like watermarks really easily. And those ones have given us the most trouble. But this felt like like velvet thing, they, I like the velvet, they, it doesn't stain so easily. So if you're gonna use a fabric, you can use velvet, but watch out for burn marks. I think it is better to considering burn marks, even though people aren't supposed to be smoking, um, it is better for that than leather, uh, but leather is completely easily cleanable. Like, and it's hypoallergenic, which is great. I'm sitting on a faux leather couch cushion right now from a new couch that we're buying. We're testing something, let me tell you about it. Um, but I will say uh, that like burning this with a cigarette, there's no way to fix it. You just have to replace the whole cushion or replace that section of couch. So with that in mind, the couch I'm sitting on, see if I can get you to link. I think I bought these on Sofa Mini as well. They're black faux leather Chesterfield style couches and they're modular. They just click together. So the arms click and the bottom clicks and the back clicks together. So what we can do is we can have 10 or 20 of them and then to keep, keep a couple in inventory. And then if somebody breaks a piece of the couch, we can just replace it. We can use two spare couches for parts, right? And so now we can very quickly replace an entire couch by fixing the piece that's broken. So it's easy for our housekeeper or someone to go into a storage closet, grab the arm of a couch and bring it in and have some maintenance guy come in real quick and put it together, right? So that serviceability or the repairability, replaceability kind of intersects there. You have to plan for things to break down. Now, so this one, 
right? We can't just patch it with a little sewing machine, but we can replace the whole chunk of it. Other things that need to be really durable in your place is like the bed frame. We've noticed that a lot of times the bed frames give out, so we've been buying these uh, like Amazon reinforced metal frames that go below the bed and kind of like stick it into the outer part of a frame. But there's been a lot of like cheapskate manufacturers on Amazon selling like really low quality versions of this. Um, and they've gone up in price. We used to get the best quality metal frames on Amazon for like 80, 90 bucks for a king. Now they're like 165 bucks for a king. And that could be just because of logistics with COVID and China shipping and stuff maybe. Otherwise people just know that these things are popular now and they can get more money for them. I don't know. But you should reinforce your bed frame. So instead of buying a $160 metal bed frame, you can go to Lowe's and get extra lumber and like reinforce the wood frame that you have. I think that's a good idea because it's definitely less than 160 bucks in lumber to reinforce what's already a wood frame. And these are all the beds. So I'm gonna have one guy go and assemble all of the beds. It's gonna be part of our like launch for these 13 units. Um, but each one, the beds will have to be reinforced because we're planning ahead for stuff like that. Now, certain things don't have to be durable, like the, like the, the fake plants and the lamps tend to not have to be durable because they're very rarely interacted with. Um, the lights have to be functional, but they don't have to be durable. And functionality is one thing too. And we're like, we're, we'll talk about that in a second. So uh, we buy our fake plants typically from Ikea or Target. We prefer the ones at Ikea because they're better price. But the, if you order them online or go into the store, it's just what they have at that store's inventory when you order online. Target, if you buy fake plants online, they'll distribute them from like a wider geographic area so you can get more. So for 13 apartments, I had to use Target to buy tons of fake plants in bulk where if it was just one or two apartments, I'd go to Ikea or ship in from Ikea, but they, they don't carry as much inventory, which makes it hard to do it at scale. But cups, plates, bowls, stuff like that, Ikea is good for that. So we buy all that kind of stuff from Ikea because you can get 80 cent plates that are good quality, 80 cent bowls that are good quality. So in mass, I mean, I think we just ordered like a hundred plates for this place, something like that. And it was super cheap, which is awesome. Now with stuff in the kitchen of the same type, we don't buy Teflon pans. We've switched to ceramic. Um, we're hoping that ceramic is a little bit more durable, doesn't create that grody, nasty, Teflon scrapey thing. Also, when you buy like cooking utensils, you should be using silicone instead of like the hard plastic because the hard plastic melts and gets into food, which is like, just super nasty. Um, and certain people know this. And if they see that you have cheap cooking utensils that kind of like start to warp and bend and like flatten out, they're like, come on guys, right? So um, silicone uh, cooking utensils ha is more durable. Um, and they they won't irk out certain guests. So, and with that said, as far as like functionality goes, that's another thing there. And the, like the Keurig machine coffee station thing, that's a functionality thing that we talked about too. See, all this stuff starts to intersect. Now, the Keurig is, the, Keurig is the easiest to wield, right? The, the regular coffee pot, people are used to. The coffee station with the Chemex, it's a little harder to like to use. So it doesn't win on the functionality side. Um, but if you, if the guest likes it as an experience, then way cool, right? Um, all the lights, lamps, switches, they all have to work. Um, the, we stopped using uh, sleeper sofas, combination of functionality and dura durability here. They eventually break. Um, sleeper sofas are hard to replace because they're heavy. Uh, they break and they're hard to do maintenance on because they're kind of like weird and you have to find somebody who's like good at repairing them. And if you can't effectively repair it, it stops being a couch. Right, it just becomes like sunken in and like off center, and they become problematic. So if they, if you lose the sleeper part of the sofa, you lose the sofa part of the sofa. So that's why we don't really like sleeper sofas anymore. We've actually switched to rollaway beds um, because they still break like sleeper sofas do, but um, they're easier to do maintenance on because you can remove it from the property and try to fix it and bring it back later. They're easier to swap out because they're smaller and they roll and they roll out, um, and they're more modular. Right, so you can have a love seat in a space that only had room for a love seat, but then you can have a sleeper sofa, like a, I mean, a rollaway bed where you can still sleep an extra person with the rollaway bed. Didn't have room for like a whole couch, but you had room for the like rollaway bed, and that is something that you can do too. Especially with couches that like this faux leather, you may not want somebody sleeping on it, so you don't want to list the couch as a sleeping space, but you can have the rollaway bed and give somebody space to sleep in in the living room. So that's another kind of pro tip: is we're getting away from sleeper sofas and into rollaway beds for that reason. So to kind of in reverse, take a look at everything I kind of just dumped on you. The most interacted with stuff on a property that you should plan for upkeep uh, and breakage and stuff like that will be the couch, the bed, um, the towels and the linens in the house, um, the cups, plates, bowls, utensils, stuff like that. Uh, the front door, the carpet, 
coming inside, you know, like that all stuff. The stuff that is least interacted with would be the fake plants, uh, would be the lights, um, the toaster probably rarely gets used, but I mean, they still get used. Um, stuff like that. Uh, stuff that it just kind of sits there and it's like, hey, that's nice. So the art on the walls, the decor, the fake plants, that stuff is rarely interacted with. So that stuff kind of just kind of lasts, right? So you should be keeping extra things on standby that are highly interacted with. I recommend keeping a spare like smart TV on standby because if somebody steals it or breaks it, you can just replace the TV. Um, we're doing these extra couches that are modular so we can replace pieces of that. We keep extra sheets and towels and stuff on standby. And now here's a pro tip for that too, guys, is you, you can do the white towels and linens and stuff and look really crisp and sharp and professional, which I love. I love that white crispy look, but they're harder to maintain. You gotta bleach them and stuff like that. Um, you don't wanna bleach them on site because then the washer could have bleach in it and you bleach your guests' clothes and they get pissed and you have to replace those. That would be bad. So you would have to launder them off site. So that becomes a thing. Now you can uh, use colored towels and stuff, but then uh, they may not seem as professional or as luxury and then there's a trade off there. But one thing you can do is if you wanna justify using colored towels and colored sheets, you can incorporate it into your design style. So that way using a purple towels in a place that has like a good purple theme is like justified, right? Now, if you use white sheets, uh, be careful what colors you have. You should probably use a blue, if anything, because um, natural white sheets um, kind of actually more dull than the vivid pearly white sheets that we all love. They're like just like, like pearly white teeth kind of white. Um, those actually have a little bit of blue in them. They're not actually a true white. So if you want to wash white with something else, probably choose a blue, like a light blue. Um, and that'll keep your white sheets lasting longer. Um, so just keep that as a pro tip. But if you wanna use colors for everything, then just justify your colors in your design style and you'll be good there. Now, if you're, if with all this set, you find yourself kind of like at a loss on budget um, and you wanna stick to that $5,000 and you wanna buy some nice stuff and you wanna do the accent walls and everything, but you just don't have enough money to build up the whole place, pro tip is you're actually designing the, the place um, for photos, not for the space, right? So you are trying to make sure that the photos look good. So if you can do two or three walls and make them look really good at certain angles, that's good enough. If you have to skip one wall and have like a basic wall, that's fine. But comp like make sure that everything else is composed and good enough that you can get the photos that you need for the Airbnb listing. And then you can work on that wall later, something like that. Um, so coming in under budget means everything that you do, do well. Think of it as photos first, not the entire space. Um, because if you do the wall with the headboard, like with the bed um, at that point, then you're like able to, um, you're able to get the photos of the bed at a couple different angles with the headboard, the back wall, with a cool backsplash or whatever, spend all the money on that. Then if the rest of the room is generally basic, that's gonna be okay to get started. Now, um, if there's things that you're not gonna slouch on money on, um, don't slouch on the mattress and don't slouch on the pillows. Um, and you probably also should make sure that you got a decent quality of, uh, of like sheets on the bed too, because the sleep experience in a, in a home is probably the most important thing. Um, the sleep experience is the most important. Now, if you have a larger home too, your cookware needs to be on point because people will be preparing meals. And if they're cooking for family, and that's a big thing for like their, their family situation, if a, if a family can't cook like they normally would because they've got to work around like really dingy stuff, that's gonna give them a negative kitchen experience, right? So eating with family is a big experience. Think of like Greek culture, Italian culture, just think, just picture Thanksgiving, right? You wanna deliver on sleep quality and on bigger properties, you wanna deliver on kitchen quality, those are big. Now, the couch will get sat on a lot, so couch cushions, having good, dense, firm cushions, is probably gonna matter because otherwise they'll start to sink in and get old. Otherwise, you have to have a plan to replace those cushions, right? So um, keep certain things of quality, the stuff that doesn't get interacted with, just make sure it looks pretty. Now, if you'd like to continue this conversation, I welcome you to qu leave questions in the comments. Talk to me directly in the comments. I manage those myself. If you wanna get a big, like hearty response on something that you want like hosts opinions on, like multiple hosts, join my Facebook group, the hosts of Airbnb Automated. There's over 16,000 people in there. We talk about all sorts of stuff. They're all super professional, super helpful people. And if you want to know what a lot of hosts think about something, that's, a, that's actually the best place on the internet to go for some good, solid feedback. Um, thank you for watching this video. I hope it was super helpful um, in your journey as a short-term rental operator, Airbnb host, small business owner. Uh, if you need me, find me in, like on Instagram, hit me up in the DMs. Uh, as per usual, I will see you on the other side.